the first five volumes of uh, Lenin's collected works, uh, we have we see the political evolution of Vladimir Ulyanov, born in Simbirsk, a Russian provincial city, into Lenin. We have the the kind of years, the beginning of his writing in the late 1880s and 1890s, all the way to the publication of probably what is his most famous work, and that is what is to be done in um, 1902, 1903. Um, and there's a lot of things to take away from this, right? This is the, the sort of political um, uh, 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 taming, I guess, of a revolutionary. He comes onto the scene having been kicked out of his university, having uh, he went to school for law, uh, and enters into these Marxist reading circles where this is a pattern for a lot of Russians at the time, radicals who are coming from the provincial cities into the capital, St. Petersburg, who join these circles to, to learn Marxism collectively. And I think that that's important to keep in mind. Lenin didn't pour over Marxism by himself. He did it with his, his emerging comrades. Um, but then he gets into his own writing and his own political thought. And very tactically, I think the, the bulk of his first, his early works that are published here, the, most of the content of one and two are trying to theorize both a tactical criticism of the uh, populace that preceded the emerging socialists, the Narodniki they're called. These are people who they thought that the, the heart of uh, Russian communism, not, mm -hmm. not capital C communism, but communism mm -hmm. would be found in the Russian peasantry. The peasantry, uh, they existed in these kind of uh, communal uh, organizations. They called them the Mirs. They had Zemsvo assemblies where peasants would come and vote collectively. And the Zemsvo was granted to them by the Tsar in the 1860s. And so the populace believed that, well, if we go to these Narodniki and we try to educate them and we tell them about their oppression, eventually they'll rise up, they'll overthrow the state, and then we will have our peasant commune because Russia is, the Russian empire is a primarily agricultural country, and that has to be the heart of our, um, uh, of our communism, lowercase c. But Lenin finds problem with this right away, right? Lenin is saying that, well, what the Noroniki are failing to recognize is that capitalism is here in Russia. It has arrived, right? This isn't, it's not something that, you know, is coming, it's here. And the bulk of his early works really talks about uh, the ways in which, in particular, there's a proletarianization of the peasantry that is going on. And it's happening in more or less in two ways. And the first way, is that certain peasants are accumulating massive tracts of land uh, and they're renting that land out to lower income and poor peasants to pay uh, for rent, right? And so you have peasants that are accumulating a massive amount in goods, in, in, in kind or in money, what have you. And what he's also saying is that these zemstva, which were originally created as uh, progressive legislative bodies within the communities are being overrun by these rich peasants who have a vested interest in both collaboration with the czarist officials uh, and in maintaining their own wealth. And so for Lenin in these early years, he's not, you know, writing tracks against the czar at this time. He's writing against these populists, the Noroniki, and trying to defeat them mm -hmm. as a leftist alternative to um, the emerging socialists. And these Noroniki, these are the same people, it's important to know, that his brother um, uh, more or less came from, his brother Alexander Ulyanov, who was executed in 1887 uh, after he was discovered for uh, conspiring to execute the Tsar. Um, so his brother is from the Narodnik tradition. Most of the Russian revolutionaries are from the Narodnik tradition. And Lenin even recognizes this in one of the early volumes. He writes a piece called Our, uh, Our Inheritance, right? Where he writes that I'm willing to grant that these Narodniki, these populists, my brother, 
are our radical predecessors. They are our ancestors. But where we differ with them is that they are failing to recognize that capitalism is here and that their form of populism doesn't work. And so this kind of constitutes the bulk of the first two or three volumes is his his uh, works against the peasantry, particularly his first major work, which is about the peasantry. But he also demonstrates this immense ability to gather information, quantitative da data, statistics from different provincial towns in Russia, and to put them all together to mobilize his argument that capitalism is in the countryside, it's in the pr provinces of Russia. Here's the data to back it up. So he's already demonstrating this this wild capacity, and he's pretty young at this time. Um, by the third volume, uh, by the third volume, you are already in the 1890s, 1898, 1899. Lenin had been married uh, to Nadezhda Krupskaya. He's exiled. He's sent first to uh, Siberia. He's arrested a few times. He serves a year in um, in Tsarist prison. That's crazy. Um, um that is 1896 he's in prison for the entire year exiled to siberia and eventually him and krupskaya they get out of there and they immigrate to western europe where now lenin is in the throes of this really vibrant and booming socialist movement in germany in particular but not just in germany in geneva and eventually he'll find himself in london and what's going on at that time in the 1890s, the late 1890s, early 1900, is the emergence of what will become known by him as economism, but what we know today as reformism. Uh, this is Edward Bernstein in his critique of Marx, where he says essentially that, you know, Marx, Marx's main idea was an argument that Marx had in mind the whole time. And so capitalism, he was trying to just prove that argument. Therefore, it's not objective. And he says that the fundamental problem with Marx is that he, his theory of capitalism rested on, and Bernstein calls it catastrophism. It's the idea that a major rupture has to happen. And once that rupture happens, there'll be a, a, a socialist revolution. And Bernstein says, this isn't coming to pass. Capitalism is getting stronger. Monopolies aren't happening in the same way that Marx thought that they would. Instead, we're getting a proliferation of smaller bourgeois businesses. And this is sort of the heart of some of your listeners may have read. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg really goes after Bernstein. But Lenin is also going after Bernstein. And Le Lenin in particular is saying, you know, great, whatever you're saying in, for Germany, it may be the case, but this is not the case in Russia. In Russia, we're still dealing with an autocracy, and it's an important context. And uh, we're still dealing with this nascent um, uh, 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 peasant uh, capitalization that's a proletarianization that's happening. And so very, I think, intelligently, Lenin sets his sight on the autocracy, knowing full well his limits. This is, He's not advocating for violent revolution at this point but he's saying that you know to form this party this russian social democratic party we have to have clear goals in mind and, and that number one clear goal has to be the mutual destruction of the autocratic regime and he says in volume uh volume four there's a there's a small piece where he writes that um that collapse of autocracy has to happen at all costs and he says even insofar as it will lead us to collaborate with the liberals because the liberals also have an interest in collapsing the autocracy so that's an interesting moment right where lenin says we have to do everything we can we have to ally ourselves even with people that we know are our enemies and that's going to make us very uncomfortable and i think that that's a moment in lenin's history that a lot of people don't really consider why because people want to understand him as the sort of the the unwavering non-collaborative revolutionary but lenin understood the importance of his place and time right and he understood his limits as well this isn't you know in 1900 1902 1903 he's not advocating at this moment for revolution but he's saying you know we need to do all that we can to 
overthrow the autocratic regime and inculcate the working class with the consciousness that will help us achieve this goal. So he, he again, he's painfully aware of those limits. And so I think that um, um, <clears throat> what he's doing in this later period is confronting that new trend in social democracy, which is uh, kind of Bernstein's let's let's achieve socialism through electoralism. Lenin saying, well, we don't have that possibility in Russia, but we do have an autocracy that needs to fall in order for anything to be um, to, to, to happen in Russia. And so that leads him, you know, from the Noro critique of the Norodniki to the, the uh, criticisms of reformism. There's a few articles in volume four, I believe, where Lenin addresses anarchists for the first time. He, call, he says that, you know, this is just bourgeois ideology that's in the service of, of the regime. You're right, they're, they're, they, don't, they have no conception of class analysis. And in fact, they're, they're uh, doing more harm for the revolutionary purpose than they are and actually creating a movement, a lasting movement. Um, and it leads eventually to volume five, which is almost... Uh, in its entirety, what is to be done, and then the amendments that he adds to what is to be done afterwards, uh, and I believe one critique of what is to be done, where all of these things come to pass in a collective work in which he's saying um, what Russia needs is a social democratic party to be led by intellectuals who are tasked with uh, bringing consciousness to the working class, educating them in the job that needs to be done. And that is the collapse of the autocratic regime. And so that's sort of where we're left off in, in uh, volume five. 